Neil A. Maxwell wrote, God is never surprised, fantasy stories to the contrary, by unexpected arrivals in the spirit world because of unforeseen deaths. But we must always distinguish between God's being able to foresee and his causing or desiring something to happen. A very important distinction. We will live for our appointed lifespan. However, we can improve both the quality of our service and our well-being by being careful by making careful, appropriate choices. There are certain immutable, law, immutable laws of nature which, if violated, will bring sickness or untimely death. Spencer W. Kimball wrote, Just as Ecclesiastes 3.2 says, I am confident that there is a time to die, but I believe that many people die before their time because they are careless, abuse their bodies, take unnecessary chances, or expose themselves to hazards, accidents, and sickness. Of the antediluvians we read, Hast thou marked the old way which wicked men have trodden, which were cut down out of time, whose foundation was overflown with the flood? In Ecclesiastes 7.17 we find this statement, Be not overmuch wicked, neither be thou foolish. Why shouldest thou die before thy time? I believe that we may die prematurely, but seldom exceed our time very much. One exception was Hezekiah, twenty-five-year-old king of Judah, who was far more godly than his successors or predecessors. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and the prophet Isaiah came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thy house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Hezekiah, loving life as we do, turned his face to the wall and wept bitterly, saying, Remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which was good in thy sight. The Lord yielded unto his prayers. I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee, and I will add unto thy days fifteen years, and I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. A modern illustration of this exceptional extension of life took place in November 1881. My uncle, David Patton Kimball, left his home in Arizona on a trip across the Salt River Desert. He had fixed up his books and settled accounts and told his wife of a premonition that he would not return. He was lost on the desert for two days and three nights, suffering untold agonies of thirst and pain. He passed into the spirit world and described later, in a letter of January 8, 1882, to his sister what happened there. He had seen his parents. My father told me I could remain there if I chose to do so, but I pled with him that I might stay with my family long enough to make them comfortable, to repent of my sins, and more fully prepare myself for the change. Had it not been for this, I should never have returned home except as a corpse. Father finally told me I could remain two years and do all the good I could during that time, after which he would come for me. He mentioned four others that he would come for also. Two years to the day from that experience on the desert, he died easily and apparently without pain. Shortly before he died, he looked up and called, Father, Father. Within approximately a year after his death, the other four men named were also dead. Erastus Snow said, Do I obtain pardon for my transgressions so that I shall escape the penalty of death? No, I do not. I may so far obtain forgiveness by faith in Christ that the sentence of death may be commuted and life prolonged, like it was with Hezekiah of old, whose life was lengthened fifteen years. There are hundreds and thousands before me here and in this territory who have had their lives lengthened out through obedience to the gospel of peace, who were languishing upon beds of death under the sentence of death, and they were on the verge of the grave, but through repentance and the elders of Israel administering to them, the power of death was stayed and their lives were prolonged. Yet the sentence of death was not revoked, but it must pass upon all mankind. Through the exercise of faith we may gain a reprieve for a few days longer, or at the farthest for a few years, to live and do good. And some might possibly attain to that glorious privilege Enoch and others obtained, that they should not sleep in the earth but be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and pass from mortal to immortality, by which means the penalty is executed and the law satisfied. Joseph Fielding Smith said, no righteous man is ever taken before his time. In the case of the faithful saints, they are simply transferred to other fields of labor. 
the Lord's work goes on in this life, in the world of spirits, and in the kingdoms of glory, where men go after their resurrection. Wilford Woodruff said, Perhaps I may be permitted to relate a circumstance with which I am acquainted in relation to Bishop Roskelly of Smithfield, Cache Valley. On one occasion he was suddenly taken very sick, near to death's door. While he lay in this condition, President Peter Mon, who was dead, came to him and said, Brother Roskelly, we held a council on the other side of the veil. I have had a great deal to do, and I have the privilege of coming here to appoint one man to come and help. I have had three names given to me in council, and you are one of them. I want to inquire into your circumstances. The bishop told him what he had to do, and they conversed together as one man would converse with another. President Mon then said to him, I think I will not call you. I think you are wanted here more than perhaps one of the others. Bishop Roskelly got well from that very hour. Very soon after, the second man was taken sick, but not being able to exercise sufficient faith, Brother Roskelly did not go to him. By and by, this man recovered, and on meeting Brother Roskelly, he said, Brother Mon came to me the other night and told me he was sent to call one man from the ward, and he named two men as he had done to Brother Roskelly. A few days afterwards, the third man was taken sick and died. Now I name this to show a principle. They have work on the other side of the veil, and they want men, and they call them. And that was my view in regards to Brother George A. Smith. When he was almost at death's door, Brother Cannon administered to him, and in thirty minutes he was up and ate breakfast with his family. We labored with him in this way, but ultimately, as you know, he died. But it taught me a lesson. I felt that man was wanted behind the veil. We labored also with Brother Pratt, but he too was wanted behind the veil. We lost one of our apostles a short time since. He was about the youngest man in the Quorum of the Apostles. He was suddenly called away from us. There is a meaning in this. Many times things take place with us that we do not comprehend unless it is given to us by revelation. But there is meaning in the loss of that young apostle. I had a manifestation of that while in San Francisco recently. One evening as I fell asleep I was very much troubled with evil spirits that tried to afflict me and while laboring to throw off these spirits and their influence, there was another spirit visited me that seemed to have power over the evil spirits, and they departed from me. Before he left me, he told me not to grieve because of the departure of Abraham Hoagland Cannon, for the Lord had called him to fill another important mission in the spirit world as a pure and holy apostle from Zion in the Rocky Mountains, a labor which would not only prove to be a great benefit to his father's household, but to the church and kingdom of God on the earth. I feel to name this because it is true. I have become acquainted with many things in our history that I have marveled at. While in the St. George Temple, I had a son who was in the north country drowned. He had a warning of this. In a dream, he was notified how he would die. We had the testimony of that after his death. I asked the Lord why he was taken from me. The answer to me was, you are doing a great deal for the redemption of your dead, but the law of redemption requires some of your own seed in the spirit world to attend to work connected with this. That was a new principle to me, but it satisfied me why he was taken away. I name this because there are a great many instances like it among the Latter-day Saints. This was the case with Brother Abraham Cannon. He was taken away to fulfill that mission. And where we have anything of this kind, we should leave it in the hands of God to reconcile. Harold B. Lee said, I know a father who lost his daughter, a mother of four or five children, and it was a long fight. I have never seen a father or mother who had greater devotion to a daughter, and as she sank into the shadows, the father said, I guess I failed. If I had faith, she would have gotten well. The Lord said that those who have faith in me shall be healed if they are not appointed unto death. That suggests that we are here filling a mission on earth. We can fail in our appointment, but if we live true, then we will fulfill our mission. Now if the Lord asks us, calls us to no greater calling, I ask you, would any of you want to remain here one hour more than the Lord wants you to live in mortality, if he had something else for you to do? Death separates the spirit and the body, which are the soul of man. That separation evokes pangs of sorrow and shock among those left behind. The hurt is real, only its intensity varies. 
Some doors are heavier than others. The sense of tragedy may be related to age. Generally, the younger the victim, the greater the grief. Yet even when the elderly or infirm have been afforded merciful relief, their loved ones are rarely ready to let go. The only length of life that seems to satisfy the longings of the human heart is life everlasting. Irrespective of age, we mourn for those loved and lost. Mourning is one of the deepest expressions of pure love. It is a natural response in complete accord with divine commandment, Thou shalt live together in love insomuch that thou shalt weep for the loss of them that die. Moreover, we can't fully appreciate joyful reunions later without tearful separations now. The only way to take sorrow out of death is to take love out of life. Eternal perspective provides peace which passeth all understanding. In speaking at a funeral of a loved one, the Prophet Joseph Smith offered this admonition. When we lose a near and dear friend upon whom we have set our hearts, it should be a caution unto us. Our affection should be placed upon God and His work more intensely than upon our fellow beings. Life does not begin with birth, nor does it end with death. Prior to our birth, we dwelled as spirit children with our Father in heaven. There. We eagerly anticipated the possibility of coming to earth and obtaining a physical body. Knowingly, we wanted the risks of mortality which would allow the exercise of agency and accountability. This life was to become a probationary state, a time to prepare to meet God. But we regarded the returning home as the best part of that long-awaited trip, just as we do now. Before embarking on any journey, we like to have some assurance of a round-trip ticket. Returning from Earth to life in our heavenly home requires passage through and not around the doors of death. We were born to die, and we die to live. As seedlings of God, we barely blossom on Earth. We fully flower in heaven. The writer of Ecclesiastes said, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die. Think of the alternative. If all 69 billion people who have ever lived on earth were still here, imagine the traffic jam. <laughs> and we could own virtually nothing and scarcely make any responsible decisions. Scriptures teach that death is essential to happiness. Now behold, it was not expedient that man should be reclaimed from this temporal death, for that would destroy the great plan of happiness. Our limited perspective would be enlarged if we could witness the reunion on the other side of the veil when doors of death opened to those returning home. Such was the vision of the psalmist who wrote, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Meanwhile, we who tarry here have a few precious moments remaining to prepare to meet God. Unfinished business is our worst business. Perpetual procrastination must yield to perceptive preparation. Today we have a little more time to bless others, time to be kinder, more compassionate, quicker to thank, and slower to scold, more generous in sharing, more gracious in caring. Then, when our turn comes to pass through the doors of death, we can say, as did Paul, the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. We need not look upon death as an enemy. With full understanding and preparation, faith supplants fear. Hope displaces despair. The Lord said, Fear not even unto death, for in this world your joy is not full, but in me your joy is full. He bestowed this gift. 
Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. As a special witness of Jesus Christ, I testify that he lives. I also testify that the veil of death is very thin. I know by experiences too sacred to relate that those who have gone before are not strangers to the leaders of this Church. To us and to you, our loved ones may be just as close as the next room, separated only by the doors of death. With that assurance, brothers and sisters, love life. Cherish each moment as a blessing from God. Live it well, even to your loftiest potential. Then the anticipation of death shall not hold you hostage. With the help of the Lord, your deeds and desires will qualify you to receive everlasting joy, glory, immortality, and eternal life. I've witnessed miracles. Many times when my medical training suggested a dismal prognosis, I've seen individuals fully recover. I've also witnessed others who relied with faith on the Lord and sought blessings with their prayers, but which prayers were not answered in the way the person or the loved one desired. The Lord has given a condition for healing blessings. He that has faith in me to be healed and is not appointed unto death, should be healed. Even when a person relies in faith on the Lord for blessings, if it is his or her appointed time to die, there will not be restoration of health. Indeed, death must come upon all men to fulfill the merciful plan of the great Creator. President Spencer W. Kimball has written, If all of the sick for whom we prayed were healed, if all of the righteous were protected and the wicked destroyed, the whole program of the Father would be annulled. No man would have to live by faith. There would be little or no suffering, sorrow, disappointment, or even death. And if these were not, there would also be no joy, success, resurrection, nor eternal life. As we exercise the undoubted power of the priesthood of God, and as we treasure his promise that he will hear and answer the prayer of faith, we must always remember that faith and the healing power of the priesthood cannot produce a result contrary to the will of him whose priesthood it is. This principle is taught in the Revelation directing that the elders of the Church shall lay their hands upon the sick. The Lord's promise is that he that hath faith in me to be healed and is not appointed unto death shall be healed. Similarly, in another modern revelation, the Lord declares that when one asketh according to the will of God, it is done even as he asketh. From all of this, we learn that even the servants of the Lord exercising His divine power in a circumstance where there is sufficient faith to be healed cannot give a priesthood blessing that will cause a person to be healed if that healing is not the will of the Lord. After one has administered, uh, has demonstrated his worthiness through good works and manifest his faith through prayer and proper administration to the sick, it must be left in the hands of the Lord, those who will be healed and those who will not. We may not always understand why someone is healed and another for whom we have exercised great faith is not. The Lord said that when the elders administered the sick, if they die, they die unto him, and if they live, they live unto him. Thou shalt weep, he said, for the loss of them that die, and more especially for those who have no hope in the glorious resurrection. And it shall come to pass that, that those that die in me shall not taste of death, for it shall be sweet unto them. And again it shall come to pass that he that hath faith in me to be healed and is not appointed unto death shall be healed. 
Listen to President Kimball's logic in this regard. If all the sick for whom we pray are healed, if all the righteous were protected and the wicked destroyed, the whole program of the Father would be annulled and the basic principle of the gospel, free agency, would be, would be ended. No man would have to live by faith. Should all prayers be immediately answered according to our selfish desires and our limited understanding, then, uh, were, uh, then there would be little or no suffering, sorrow, disappointment, or even death. And if these were not, there would be no joy, success, resurrection, or eternal life, or godhood. Being human, we would expel from our lives physical pain, mental anguish, and assure ourselves of continual, continued ease and comfort. But if, we, but if we were to close the doors upon sorrow and distress, we might be excluding our greatest friend and benefactors. Suffering can make saints of people as they learn patience, long-suffering, and self-mastery. Joseph Smith said, The Lord takes many away, even in infancy, that they may escape the envy of man and the sorrows and the evils of this present world. They were too pure, too lovely, to live on this earth. Therefore, if rightly considered, instead of mourning we have reason to rejoice, as they are delivered from the evil, and we shall have them again. Although the Savior could heal all whom he would heal, this is not true of those who hold his priesthood authority. Mortal exercises of that authority are limited by the will of him whose priesthood it is. Consequently, we are told that some whom the elders bless are not healed because they are appointed unto death. Similarly, when the Apostle Paul sought to be healed from the thorn in the flesh that buffeted him, the Lord declined to heal him. Paul later wrote that the Lord explained, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul obediently responded that he would rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Neil A. Maxwell wrote, On the other side of the veil there are perhaps 70 billion people. They need the same gospel and releases occur here to aid the Lord's work there. Each release of a righteous individual from this life is also a call to new labors. Those who have true hope understand this. Therefore, though we miss the departed righteous so much here, hundreds may feel their touch there. One day those hundreds will thank the bereaved for gracefully foregoing the extended association with choice individuals here in order that they could help hundreds there. In God's ecology, talent and love are never wasted. The hopeful understand this too.